Amen. All right. Genesis chapter number two. Of course, Genesis chapter one, we did last week, which covers the account of the first six days of creation and everything that was accomplished in them. Now, we see it starting off in chapter 2. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, I covered this a little bit last week, so I'm not going to go into too much detail this week, how we can deduce it, it is apparent that God created the earth in seven literal days. Um, one of the reasons being the seventh day here, that um, the seventh day is a day of rest. And it says that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. God blessed this seventh day. And he sanctified it, meaning he set it apart as his day of rest. He did all of this work for six days. He created everything. I would say that's a lot of work. And um, everything that is the universe, the, you know, the heavens, the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, all the, the living creatures, everything he created in six days. And he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, um, while we don't have to observe the Sabbath day in the New Testament, you know, I, I'm not going to preach all about that. That's a whole sermon in and of itself. But that's something that has been fulfilled with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, the reason being that he came and died for our sins and he represents the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is the Sabbath because we need to enter into his rest. And the Bible talks about that too, about entering into God's rest, entering into his rest. You know, we work and we work and we work and we work, but we find rest in Jesus Christ because that is where our salvation lies. We need to, for, to be saved. And, and it's, a, it's amazing how all of these great truths from the very first chapter, from the very first book of the Bible, God is already laying out these great truths regarding salvation. And in the second chapter, it's about that rest, that seventh day that's holy, it's sanctified. It's a day of rest. Jesus Christ did all of the work for us. We need to enter into that rest in order to be saved. We need to cease from our own works. We need to, to, to recognize that no matter how hard you work, you are not going to make it into heaven. And salvation is a rest for us. We can, it's a relief, right? Think about it. So it you could work, you could be like, man, you know, we talk to people all the time. Sometimes people are just really concerned. I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven or not. You know, I, I'm trying really hard. I'm trying to do what's right, but I just, you know, sometimes I just still sin and I do what's wrong. And um, because they're trusting in their works, they're trusting in trying to, to do good, there's no rest for that person. They can never be assured that they're saved unless they have a totally false view of how good they are. Because the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. We cannot make it in on our works. We just need to receive that free gift that gift provides us the rest that we need. We have the relief, that, that freedom of mind to be able to understand that I don't have to worry about it. Jesus already took care of that for me. I'm going to enter into his rest. And entering into his rest is a holy day. It's set apart. It's sanctified that seventh day that God, it's, it's symbolic of our salvation of ceasing from our own works to make it and just trusting in Christ. But beyond the, the symbolic reference to our salvations, to our salvation, even though we don't have to honor the Sabbath day anymore, the New Testament, as New Testament believers, I still think that there's a benefit to taking a day and resting from your works. Just physically speaking, we need to be able to give our bodies a rest. You know, you can't push yourself day after day, week after week after week after week, 
and you know burn the candle at both ends so to speak and just be working 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 non-stop you need to be able to take a break for your health everything that God has designed for us is good and when he made these laws it's good and we see God himself taking a break and resting obviously there's a huge symbolic reference we already covered that but even beyond the symbolism giving yourself a rest your immune system is gonna wear down well, if you just never take a break and if you're constantly working now look I'm all for having a good work ethic I strongly believe in men that work and work and work and work hard but for our benefit we also need to be able to take a day of rest sometimes we need to be able to just say okay I'm gonna recharge my batteries I'm gonna you know just just cool it for a little bit let your body catch up because the more you 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 work yourself if you work your, if you overwork yourself you work yourself too hard it's just gonna lower your immunity you end up getting more sick and then it's gonna impact you know if, if your ultimate goal is to be able to work as much as possible anyways you should follow this advice of being able to take a day at least one day a week to be able to to, to kind of relax a little bit and take it a little bit easier and and give yourself a rest because if you if you don't do that it's gonna your whole body's gonna suffer and then you won't be able to produce as much it's a similar thing with the land you know God provided um, six years to be cultivating and, and reaping and harvesting the earth and then the seventh year was it was a, a Sabbath year of, of rest for the land right you're supposed to just let it let it go you know don't be working that ground so hard let the, give the earth time to rest and when you don't do that you start seeing smaller and smaller and smaller yields it's it's the way God designed everything there's just a lot of wisdom in this in this one you know couple verses here about taking a day of rest and we see God doing it it was good for God it's good for us um, so don't uh, skip over that but let's keep going here I covered a little bit about the Sabbath last week anyways let's look at verse number four now the Bible says here these are the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens now you could look at that word generations and someone will say again as I covered last week people who believe in these real long ages and they'll say see the generations because they'll think about it in terms of like a generation of um, a person you know a person's you have generations from uh, of people of human beings as a approximately 30 years in a generation and um, they'll, they'll see this where it says these are the generations and they'll automatically assume that this is an extended period of time but it's not when it's talking about the generations it's it's the beginnings it's the starts it's the, it's the starting point it's when God actually created the heavens and the earth and uh, we're in Genesis chapter 2 and if we jump down to verse number 5 here so it's say well verse I'll reread verse number 4 these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground and I think that's pretty neat because it says in verse 5 that he created the plant of the field before it was in the earth right so he was he created it before it was even ever planted in the ground and he explains that um, you know it hadn't rained yet we're used to having rain now to, to rain on the crops and get that yield but back then it hadn't rained it hadn't rained until Noah and the flood we're gonna get to that later but he had caused it just to have a mist coming up from the ground to provide the the moisture for the plants to grow and he says also there was not a man to till the ground verse number six says but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground verse number seven and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul now a lot of people like to point to this and say see this is a contradiction in the Bible you know because w what they do and it's it's really silly in my opinion I think it I think it's a total lack of understanding of just just reading the Bible in general and just reading it on for his face value they'll say oh well God just got done creating everything and now he's creating man you know this is past the seventh day because we saw in chapter 2 
that it was already the seventh day and God rested and now he's creating man and breathing into his breath and stuff. Look, chapter one just gives us the timeline, right? It gives us the first, and then chapter two finishes with the seventh day. Then we go back and we get more details about the story, about the story of creation, about these things. Just because he's mentioning God forming man here and, and everything, does, it doesn't um, contradict in any way what the Bible's talking about when it gives the timeline first. First, he gives us that overview. says, okay, here's the seven days. This is what I did on this day, this day, this day, this day. And now he's going to give us more details. For example, with the, with the seeds of the earth, you know, with... Um, the plants of the earth and the mist coming up from the ground. And now he tells us exactly how he made man, like out of the dust of the earth. I also heard another um, false doctrine a long time ago when I was newer to soul winning and newer to preaching the gospel. I'd gone out and I talked to someone and um, they had said that our flesh is our soul. And they pointed to this verse. Now, I was younger in the faith. I was going out. I was trying to win souls and didn't have as much knowledge back then. But I knew, you know, I knew we had souls. I knew we have a spirit. And um, I knew we had a body. But I wasn't as good at, at being able to answer all of these questions. Especially when someone just points to a verse. And I believe every word of God is true. So if someone's going to point to someone and say, oh yeah, you know what, I, you know, I believe the Bible, obviously. But oftentimes when someone who believes in a false doctrine will point out one verse, they, they say it and, and already have kind of planted in your head a certain understanding of it. Sometimes it's harder to, to, to understand what it really means um, when you've already have that, that preconceived idea going into it of someone telling you, well, no, you know, your flesh is the earth. And what they do is they look at verse number seven. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So you see, that flesh, that, that dirt from the ground, he became a living soul. Like it just, the, the flesh became the living soul. And that's what, that was their argument. Now, this is very easy to prove wrong using plenty of other scripture. And you can see where, um, and let's turn to a few places because actually, the Bible tells us that we do have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And Matthew 10, 28, I don't remember at the time if that, if that person was a Jehovah's Witness or not. And I, I don't know for sure if they believe in this. Um, I, so I don't want to say that they do because I can't remember what the guy was. It was quite a while ago. But they wanted to focus on this verse. And just a tip, when you do go out and preach the gospel to people, Avoid foolish questions and avoid these types of things. Does a person have to believe that a, you know, it's not your flesh that's a soul in order to get saved? No. I, I would just steer away from these types of distractions and these types of rabbit holes as much as possible. Just say, you know what, let's talk about that. But first, I want to show you the gospel. I want to, show, I just want to, I want to talk about eternal life. I want to talk about you know, Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection. That's what you need to be focused on. Because your goal when you go out soul winning is to, is to preach the gospel. You're not there trying to, to correct them on every single false doctrine they might have under the sun. You want to just show them the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. That's the goal. You know, another time if you want to, you know, visit them or whatever and show them some more things in the Bible, great. You know, nothing wrong with that. But when you go out soul winning, try to avoid these foolish types of a question. Um, but it's very easily disproven. In Matthew 10:28. And especially if, if they do happen to be a Jehovah's Witness, this is a good place for them to go. Matthew 10, 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So here we have a clear verse making a distinction between the soul and the soul. And the body. They're two different things. So in order, you know, if, if this meant in Genesis 2, you know, man became a living soul, that that meant his flesh is the soul, then this verse wouldn't make too much sense in Matthew 10, 28, where he says, you know, to fear God, basically, that's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And the reason why I mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses is because this is talking about your soul going to hell, not just your soul, but also your body. 
because people's bodies will be in hell one day after the great white throne judgment at the that resurrection of the dead when people because when when a person dies today right our bodies get get buried in the ground they get buried in the grave and when a person dies their soul either goes to heaven or hell so their body stays here their soul is going to go one place or the other so the souls that are in hell right now their body is not in hell just their soul is there same thing that's in heaven but obviously when jesus christ comes back the believers are going to get their brand new body we're going to get glorified bodies our, our body is going to be changed in the moment in a twinkling of an eye the bible says we're going to get brand new bodies but it's not just for the believers that are going to get their bodies at the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium when the when the dead are cast up and you can read about this in revelation chapter 20 and the dead are standing before god before they get cast into the lake of fire they will be reunited with their body and this is what matthew 10 28 is talking about he's able to destroy both soul and body in hell and um they'll be, be in a corrupted body not a not a glorified one like we're going to get but um you know, first Thessalonians, you don't have to turn there, but First Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have three parts, and that verse very clearly lays it out. We have a spirit, a soul, and a body. And these three are distinct. And this is a way also that I like to explain the Godhead to people that don't understand this. Um, because it's difficult. It could be tricky to, to teach that. We've been running into people a lot lately that have a hard time grasping the concept of Jesus Christ being the Son, but also being God at the same time. It's one thing to show them the verses, because we do this. We'll show them like 1 Timothy 3.16, you know, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. We see, see, look, God became a man. We show them John chapter 1, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you could show them these scriptures that, that really flat out show you the Bible saying this. But the comprehension is still kind of hard. It's, it's difficult to say, well, wait, I, don't, I still don't get it. How can God be with God? someone and be someone at the same time it doesn't make any sense to me one of the things that i like to use as an illustration is is ourselves we have a body a soul and a spirit but it's we're one person right i'm david burson's i'm one man but i am comprised of three parts which are all me when i die my my body will be buried in the ground or whatever people end up doing to it. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it gets buried and not burned up. I, I don't know. But I'll have nothing to say about that once that day comes. But that body is still, in a sense, me. People will come to my wake or funeral or whatever, and, and it'll be to pay respects to me because there's my body. But my soul and my spirit are going to be departed from that body. Right? And I will be... My soul and spirit will be me as well. So there's these three aspects of me, but it's still all one person, if that makes sense. I mean, hopefully, it, it, is a, it is kind of a difficult concept to grasp, but it's a way that you can explain it. And there's other, there's other scriptures, too, that, that um, like the Bible says in James 2.26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We're considered dead when our body doesn't have our spirit anymore. When our spirit departs from the body, the body is dead. And um, that's obviously showing the departure and that, that we can be separated. It's not like your soul and your spirit and your, and your body are always going to be remain linked together forever. No, when, when our physical body is gone. And if you're saved, though, the good news is well, if you're saved, you will be reunited with your body and we will become that, that three-part person again except with a, with a glorified body, one that, that is not corruptible, one that is um, in the image of Christ. And um, I've, got, I've got a few other references here that just indicate the difference between the soul and the spirit and the, and the body. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Ecclesiastes 3.21 says, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast 
that goeth downward to the earth. And I guess one of the points I wanted to make with that verse is that us having a soul is what's unique to being a human. I believe animals have spirits because it's talking about the, the spirit of the beast in Ecclesiastes uh, 3. The, you know, who knows the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. But when, man, when God breathed into man's nostrils, he became a living soul. This is something that is very unique to us as human beings. Um, animals do not have souls. They have these spirits, but they don't have a soul. Um, human beings have souls, and that is, is the key difference. Well, one of the key differences that makes us different from every other animal and every other beast of the field is that we have that. Now, um, understanding this concept basically of having a body, a soul, and a spirit is going to be very important, um, especially next week when we get into chapter three, because in chapter three we're going to see where Adam and Eve break God's law. And they have the punishment that comes upon them. And the reason why it's important, jump down to verse 6. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. Sorry, if, you, if you're not in there, go flip back to Genesis chapter 2. Because in Genesis 2, we, we, we read, we see God's commandment unto Adam. About not eating, you know, being able to eat of any tree of the garden, but, you know, there's the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil he's not supposed to eat from. And in chapter 3 is when, when he breaks that, that law. But in chapter, uh, verse number 16 of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So God tells him this, The very day, the same day that you eat of that fruit, you are going to die. And... This is one of the reasons why it's so important to understand the difference between the, our body, our souls, and our spirit. Because as we'll see in chapter 3, and as, you know, everyone here probably has already read, um, Adam does break that law, but he doesn't physically drop dead the day that he eats that fruit, does he? Nope. It doesn't happen. So when God said that you're going to surely die, he wasn't talking about his flesh. He was talking about his spirit. Okay, and, and I'm going to go into that a lot more detail next week. It's going to be part of chapter 3. But I wanted to lay some of the groundwork for that here in chapter 2 since um, we see God breathing into man and he became a living soul. But let's, um, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading verse number 8. It says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So God makes this garden and, and he wants Adam to be there. Verse number nine says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. And he goes on and explains the different um, rivers that are coming out of Eden. Let's jump down to verse number 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of, of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So a purpose, God makes his garden and he makes man. He puts Adam in there. He says, okay, your job, and even from day one, he's in paradise, right? He's in, he's in this great garden. God has everything laid out for him, anything he could possibly want. He's got the food, it's right there at his fingertips. But he put him there to dress it and to keep it. Adam wasn't just, I mean, he had, he had something to do, right? He had work to do. And I believe that God, and you know, people have a false idea of what heaven is going to be like because they think it's going to be like you sitting on this cloud and like everyone's going to be catering to you and you, know, you won't have to lift a finger or do anything. No. God has work for us to do. God had work for Adam to do from day one. He had to, to, to dress and to keep the vineyard, or the, the garden, excuse me. He had to dress and to keep it. That was his job. We're going to have work to do in serving the Lord and serving God in the afterlife. And what I always like to tell people is, you know, we ought to get used to it now. Get used to being a good worker. Get used to... You know, we're going to be singing praises to God. So when you're in church, sing the hymns. Sing, you know, sing the praises to God now. Get good at it now. You're going to be doing it for the rest of your life. If you don't, you know, for the rest of eternity, I should say. Because <laughs> your life isn't going to end if you're saved. You have everlasting life. It doesn't stop. It doesn't end. 
It goes on forever. But we are going to have work to do. We're going to have things to do. But there's great joy in that. And hopefully we're not at a stage where you think that, oh, man, work. Like, like I don't want to have anything to do with work. No, work is good. Work, especially when you're doing work for the Lord. When you're doing a good work, when you're doing good things for God, it is a very good thing and it brings you joy and it's going to bring you fulfillment and, and peace and comfort and all of those things from doing the work of the Lord. And um, if you've never done it before, maybe that's why you might look at me a little bit funny like, wait a minute, I don't think I want to do any work. Do some work for God now. You could experience some of that joy for yourself and you'll see what I'm talking about. And, um, you know, God gave Adam here a job to do. He had to dress and keep. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't a very difficult job. I don't think. He had, he, had, he had all the food. Anything that he needed was provided for him. God is a great God. He took care of him. But he still had work to do. He still had a job to do. And um, we have jobs to do as well. And God promised to take care of us. That's why he said not to, not to worry about you know, the riches and, and making your money and what am I going to wear tomorrow and what am I going to eat. He said, God knows what your needs are. God knows how to take care of you. You know, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God wants our hearts in the right place in serving him. He knows how to take care of us. We don't need to be so worried and distressed about those things. He can take care of us. Let's keep reading here. Verse number, well, we already read the, the commandments. Well, verse 16. He says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So God gives him freedom. He says, Look, you have your choice of all of these different trees of the garden. Freely eat. And oftentimes today, I think people get too hung up on the, the little tiny details of your life and they have a hard time getting through like, man, I don't know what God wants me to do. Should I have oatmeal or should I have pancakes for breakfast today? I don't know. God, God, tell me, what should I eat today? You can freely eat. Now, it, does, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but we, we have a tendency sometimes, and don't take this the wrong way. We need to go to God with our problems we should cast our cares upon Jesus and look to him for answers. But there's a lot of things in our life that it's up to you. He's given us free will for a reason. He's given us the ability just to choose. And there's so many things in our life that have nothing to do with sin. There is no right answer. It's just, well, whatever you want. You know, Adam, he didn't tell him, you have to eat of this tree today, that tree tomorrow, this tree the next day. He said, look, you can freely eat. How much do you want to eat? Go ahead, just do it. You know, Eat a lot, eat a little, eat this, eat this one, that one. But he put one restriction, restriction on it. He says, out of all of them, you could freely eat. Verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. He says, that's the one thing. It's the one rule. He gave Adam all this freedom. All the freedom he could want. Just, there's just this one thing I don't want you to do. Um, and really, there's, we have more than just one commandment today out of the Bible. But God gives us a lot of freedom with what we want to do with our lives. There's just a few things. I mean, you can look through the Bible and say, okay. And a lot of them, hopefully you don't, wouldn't want to do anyways. You start reading like Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. You start looking at some of those wicked sins. And so I was like, I wasn't going to do that anyways, God. So don't worry about it. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to lie with my sister or do any of this other stuff. But ultimately, there's really not that many rules. There's not that many commandments that, that God has for us. They're all for our benefit. And um, he's given us quite a bit of freedom and that great gift of free will to be able to just choose and decide what we want to do. And we see this too. He gave it with Adam. He just said, okay, there's this one rule. And of course, Adam couldn't, couldn't handle that and still um, broke that rule. But we'll, again, we'll get into that in chapter 3. Let's keep reading here. I want to get into my next point. It says, um, so he gives them that, that rule. Verse number 18 says, And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field but for Adam, there was not found in help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman 
and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now we see here, you know, jump back to verse 18. God said it is not good that the man should be alone. So when God created man, first, the first thing he's saying is, okay, I don't think it's good for man to be alone. And there's a lot of things that I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the sermon tonight that might go contrary to what this world thinks and what the world teaches. Because the world's going to tell you, you have children, and as they grow up, they need to go to college. So you send them off when they're 18, send them out of the house, to go, go to college or to go get a job or whatever, that basically they hit that age 18, that magic age, and they're out of our house. And you need to live on your own. Well, be careful with that. The Bible says it's not good for the man to be alone. And, and I believe that. I believe that the, the family structure that God has created is there for a reason. For one, it provides for accountability. I don't think you should be so quick to kick your children out of the house at the age of 18. The Bible says nothing about that anywhere in Scripture. That is unscriptural. That's, that's the way, that's the wisdom of this world is going to teach you that. That's why it says in verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That is the, the purpose and the reason for a person even leaving their parents' household is so that they can cleave unto their wife and they too can become one flesh. That is, should be the instance, that should be the, the reasoning for a person ever leaving their household. Um, now, maybe not everyone's going to get married. Okay, well then stay at home with your parents. You, the structure is very important. The, the level of accountability, as soon as kids get out, look, I know this firsthand. I'm one of the kids that was sent off to college at the age of 18. Very foolish. Very big mistake. Because guess what kids do when they've got no parents around telling them what to do and they're 18 years old and they're worldly and they're not saved or whatever. They're, they're just off in the world doing things that the world does. And getting into all kinds of mischief, getting into all kinds of sin. And sadly enough, there's, there's kids today that are even, and, and always have been, you know, they go away, they get drunk, they get defiled, they'll get raped, they'll get killed, they'll, they'll, you know, choke on their own vomit at the age of 18, 19, 20 years old. And for what? For what? Such a waste. Such a waste of life. But they're still kids. They need to have that accountability. They need to be, have some form of structure where the mom and the dad is at home so that when they come home, they're not going to be going out to these crazy parties. They're not going to be going out and get involved with the wrong people. They could still have some accountability to come back home to. And then once a person gets married, well, now you have a spouse. Now you have someone else that you're coming home to. See, there's, there's always this level of accountability where you're not just completely unleashed to just go off and do whatever you want because no one's going to see, no one's going to care, no one's going to know. Now obviously God knows everything and we ought to have that attitude in our lives no matter where we are. We're, we're living at home, you're, you know, you're married, whatever, whatever your situation, always keep that in mind that God sees everything, God knows everything. You never get away with anything. But it's just, it just doesn't make sense for these kids to go off and, and to be on their own because it's the temptations are great, especially when you're young. The temptations are great for fornication, for the drugs, for the alcohol, for the partying, for everything else that goes along with it, and it's wickedness. And by the way, if you live that kind of life, don't go back to it in your conversations. Don't revel in what you used to do. We need to get the proper attitude of sin in our life. We need to hate that sin. We need to have the proper attitude that says, you know what? I ought not to be talking about these things that I used to do because they don't bring honor and glory unto God whatsoever. If I ever mention anything I've done in the past, it's going to be in a very negative light. Yes, I used to do that, and it's wicked and wrong and sinful, and it ruined my life. There's a lot of things that I did that I wish I could have undone right now, but I can't. It's over. It's done with. And I'm not going to dwell on them. I'm not going to focus on them. I'm not going to bring them up because it's in the past. It's behind me. I'm going to keep my eyes focused on... on the prize on the mark, and I'm just going to move forward. 
God's already forgiven me for those sins. And I've confessed and forsaken them. And I'm going to keep moving forward. But we need to make sure that we're not, you know, even just talking about them can have an influence on other people. Right now, I'm pretty strong in my faith. I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty solid. Tempting me with, with some of the things I used to do, not that difficult for me anymore. Right now, today, that can change in a week, in a year. Any low points happen, some tragedy happens. Some of the things I used to do, you know, booze, whatever, maybe, maybe there'll be a day when that's going to start rearing its ugly head and, and start to try to get me back into that because it's something I used to do. Well, when you're hanging around people and then other people start talking about all these good times, oh yeah, I remember I got drunk and all this other stuff and just talking, talking it up, it's going to mess with my mind and get me back into that, into that mindset where you, don't, you ought not to have anybody be. And um, so just be careful with the things that come out of your mouth. But um, let's get back a little bit more on track here with, with what God says to Adam. He says, it's not good for the man to be alone. And I believe that. And, and we shouldn't be sending our kids off to just go be alone somewhere just because they hit this magic age of 18. It doesn't mean anything. Let's follow a biblical, scriptural um, advice for, for how we ought to be raising our kids. And when the kids leave the house, it's because they're going to get married and they're going to start their own family. But look at the, the, the second portion of verse 18. He says, I will make him and help meet for him. The reason why God created woman is twofold. One is because he didn't want the man to be alone. And two, he wanted to create and help meet for him, suitable for Adam. Woman was created as a help for the man. Now, this is not an anti-woman sermon or even an anti-woman point okay i just want to get back to the old-fashioned way of the way we view men and women and their roles in a family together because today we have a world that's going to try to tell you that a woman needs to act like a man and that basically you have two men in a family because they're both out working and the woman in order, the world's going to tell you that in order for a woman to be successful, they need to be a CEO of a company and they need to have all this other stuff and they need to have their own life and their own business and their own whatever. The Bible says that, that Eve was created, that woman was created to be a help for the man. And the Bible says that the man, the husband is the head of the household. And the Bible says that the woman is supposed to, well, let's just turn it, turn to Ephesians chapter 5 if you would. Let's just get it straight from the word of God. You remember our memory verse in Titus chapter 2. If you remember our memory verse, Titus 2, 3 says, The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good obedient to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. We have a great teaching here in Titus 2.5 about the younger women being discreet, being chaste, being keepers at home, meaning they're not off at some job somewhere. They're not off making the money and bringing home the bacon for the family. They're keepers at home. They're good. They're obedient to their own husbands because their husband is the head of the household and is the decision maker for the family. That the word of God be not blasphemed. Yes, that is the word of God. The Bible says, if you're not, ladies, if you're not obedient to your own husbands, you're blaspheming the word of God. If you're not chaste, if you're not a keeper at home, if you're not good, if you're not discreet, all these things it lays out in Titus 2 5, that's blaspheming the word of God. Ephesians chapter 5, look down at verse number 22. And again, this is not against women. This is just getting a biblical view of how a marriage should look. These are attributes and values that God has written down in the Bible for us to learn and to understand. I believe that women are to be honored. And we're going to see that in Ephesians chapter 5. Why can't we get back to the days where men would hold doors open for the ladies? And 
give compliments and stand up in a room and push a chair in and, and honor a woman the way that she ought to be. It's treating a woman with respect and with honor, but men and women have different roles. God has created a man different than a woman, and it's obvious. It should be obvious today. It's getting, it's getting less obvious when you look at people, but you should be able to look at someone and be like, hey, look, there's a man. Hey, here's a man. There's a man. There's a woman. And it should just be clear as day because God made us different. And since he made us different, we have different functions and different roles, and he lays them all out for us in the Bible. Ephesians 5 verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. It, it repeats that Titus 2, 5 that I just got done saying, obedient to their own husbands. Verse number 23, and he explains this. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, I didn't write this book, but I believe it. And I believe every word to be true. And in 2014, these are going to be called um, misogynistic and hateful and degrading to women. But I don't care what the world thinks at all. I don't care. I care about what God thinks. And if God says that his plan for a family, for a husband and a wife, is that the wife is supposed to submit herself unto the husband as unto the Lord, think about it, because that's a strong statement. Think about how you would submit yourself unto God. How do you submit yourself to God? I mean, are you, are you going to be like, no, God, I don't want to do that and have that type of an attitude? I mean, hopefully not. Some people do. Hopefully not. Hopefully you have enough reverence and respect for God that you wouldn't have that type of an attitude. Well, that's the way that wives are supposed to submit themselves to their own husbands. And he explains that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the, As much as Christ is the head of our church, the husband is the head of the wife. But now he goes into the husbands. In verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. See, now you're going to start to see the balance here. You're going to start to see, oh, it's not just that, you know, the husband is this dictator and he's mean and he's just going to, you know, treat his wife as a slave and, you know, all. that's not what the Bible's talking about. There's a role, there's a position. And, and think about it, this only makes sense. You have two people, a husband and a wife, in a family. Decisions have to be made from time to time, like, okay, we have this money, we have this income, and what are we going to do with it? We're going to need to, you know, buy food and, and provide shelter and buy clothing and do, you know, and do all these other things. Well, what do you do when there's a disagreement about that type of stuff? If there's not one person that is established as the authority, but you have two equals, how do you deal with that situation? One person wants one thing, the other one wants the other. And, and if, they're if they're both equal in authority within the household, it's going to lead to a lot of fighting. At least on whatever issues you don't agree on. Because then who's going to determine, well, who do we go with? There's, there's no, I mean, you can make up whatever ways you want for trying to deal with it, but there's not going to be a real good solution for that. God's got the best solution. He says, you know what, I'm going to deal with that problem right now. There's one person in charge. And this is who I've chosen to do that. And it's, it's the husband. And that's his role. He's, his, he's responsible for that. But with that responsibility of making those decisions, it's, it's, it's a great responsibility. You need to, you know, the husband has to, has to worry about a lot more things than, than the, the wives have to worry about in general with, with making these decisions because we're responsible for loving our wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, that's the type of love you ought to have for your wife. Enough to just be selfless and give yourself for your wife. You let yourself be killed as Christ let himself be killed for the church. And all the ministry and all the things that he did for the church, that's the type of love that we ought to have to our wife. Verse 26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. 
So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Notice this next verse, because it's, it's almost identical to what we just read in Genesis 2. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is God's plan for a marriage. Is it popular today? No, but it's, it's, it used to be. You go back to the 40s, 50s. This is, this is what a family looked like. You'd have the woman staying at home, raising the children, while the husband is off at work and providing for his family. This is a solid family structure that ought to be in place today, and this is what I wholeheartedly believe in because it comes from the Word of God. And this is also why, it, you know, when it says that, uh, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his, unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Think about this now. You know, when people get married, the wife, it's the wife that loses her last name, right? And she takes on the name of her husband. It's because we become one. We're one person. When my wife and I, my wife was Leslie Allen, I'm David Burzens. When we got married, that changed. She's no longer known as Leslie Allen. Now she's called Mrs. David Burzens. Notice, I'm not called Mr. David Allen. I'm Mr. David Burzens and she's Mrs. David Burzens because we're one flesh. And the reason why the man's name is chosen over the woman's is because she's the help for the man. Now, that doesn't degrade her or make her less valuable in any way, shape, or form. It's just her new role. Her role now is with her husband to be a help meet for him. And we are one flesh. And now also, as a decision maker, I have one flesh to consider of me and my wife with everything that I do. It's not just about me. I don't just make decisions about me separate from her because we're not separate. We're one flesh. I need to do everything with consideration of my wife and, of course, of my children as well. Um, <clears throat> now, for the men, and I, and I know I, some of this, I, I kind of jumped around in my notes a little bit. We're almost done here, but um, your wife is not just like a workhorse. Because you know, the Bible says she's, meet, she's a help meet for you. Don't take this the wrong way in thinking that like, well, she's just my slave or she's my workhorse or she's just like livestock or cattle that's just there to do work for me. Because that's not what the Bible's saying. And that's exactly why when God brought all of the animals to Adam, none of them were a help meet for him. If, if your wife was there just to be your workhorse or just to be your cattle, then he would have given Adam the workhorse and be like, here you go, here's your help meet for you. But that's not the case. She's there mostly to provide the companionship and love to be that, that help meet because, because she was literally taken from man. Genesis 2.23 says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And as Ephesians 5 states, we're to love our wives as our own bodies because we're one flesh. We need to, um, verse 28 of Ephesians 5 says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Now, our marriages are very important to God. The Bible shows us that our marriages are symbolic in Ephesians 5. It shows that it's a symbolic of Christ in the church. That was what he was, he keeps going back and forth. He's saying, okay, you know, the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And, he, and he's going back and forth and showing us the symbolic references between our marriage and Christ in the church. And it's an extremely important truth. And it's a truth that we can actually live out if you're married today. And 
if you're going to be glorifying to God, you ought to live out this truth to the best of your ability, as closely as possible as to what the Bible says. That's, it's extremely important we don't defile that symbol of Christ and the church in our marriages. This concept of this truth is fundamental. Your children are going to learn from what they see in your marriage. They'll be able to learn more about Christ and the church if they see you having a marriage that God has ordained because he's, he's tying the two so closely together. There's so much truth about Christ's love for us, about Christ's love for his bride that we ought to be able to show that within our own marriages. Our children will be able to gain that understanding of the big biblical truth as well. So you want to make sure that you maintain a marriage that lines up with Ephesians 5. And I, I believe this wholeheartedly. The way that Christ loves the church. Jesus Christ, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. When we get saved, we have eternal we have assurance of our salvation we know that god is never going to leave us or forsake us we know that once we get saved hey he's there forever and we go out towing all the time people say well what if you turn your back on god god will not turn his back on you once you become a child of god you're in his family you are there he's as a loving father he may have to discipline you or chastise you but you're always his son you're always his child and with the reference with marriage that's why God hates divorce. That's why it was not ordained for men, to, men and women to get divorced. The Bible says there's only the, the saving for the cause of fornication is because of the hardness of your hearts. He gave you this all. But from the beginning, it was not so. And we're in the beginning in Genesis chapter 2 for a man leaving his father and mother and cleaving unto his wife. He does not want, the Bible says in Malachi, that God hates divorce because divorce is showing you it's, it's, it's screwing up this picture of Christ in the church. Christ, once he shed his blood for you, once he's paid for your sins, it's done, it's over. You're bought, you're paid for with the price. You belong to him. That can never change. And when people get divorced, it, it, it screws up that whole picture, that whole image. And these days, I'm wondering how children are growing up to even have the, the proper concept of what a relationship might even look like where someone can actually stay with another person until death do they part, as they promised. Kids growing up with, the, with parents that get split up, now they're getting, getting married, divorced, married, divorced multiple times, and they're seeing this pattern The concept is going to be foreign to them of a God that's going to, going to love them and keep them and, and that even when they screw up and do wrong, he'll still be there for them. That's the way your marriage should look, even when the husband or the wife does wrong. That's why it says for better or for worse. That's why for worse is in there because if it was just for better, you wouldn't even have to make a vow because, well, if everything is going great, yeah, why would you split up? It's when times are going bad, when things are rough, when you're having a hard time. You've made that vow. That's what a marriage is. You're making a commitment. That's the whole point of marriage is just saying you're never going to leave. And it's wickedness. I don't think this should ever come out of anyone's lips. If you're married, don't ever threaten to leave your spouse. Ever. That's wickedness. Don't ever threaten to get a divorce or to leave. Those words, you've made the vow, you've made the choice. If you're going to honor God and honor Ephesians 5 and honor your own vow, and if you want to, if you have children, if you want to give them the proper understanding and, and not screw up that symbolism and not lie, be a liar and go against your own vow, we ought to be able, at the very least, with your spouse, you ought to be able to just trust. To have that one that one level of being able to say, I know that my wife is never going to leave me and I know I'm never going to leave her. My wife has that assurance for me. She knows that I will never divorce her. Never. It's not going to happen. You say, well, what if she, what if she commits adultery and I'm never going to divorce her? She knows that because what about Christ? Christ. If our marriage is supposed to be representative of Christ in the church, 
What if I commit a sin against Christ? Is Christ going to leave me? Is he going to divorce me? Is he going to put me away? Is he going to throw me into hell? Nope. In all of my sin, Christ is still going to be there for me because I have eternal life, everlasting life. I've made a vow unto my wife and I'm going to keep that vow. I guarantee you that I'm never going to back off from that one thing for sure. I may not be the best husband. I never claim to be. But I know that I won't ever leave her because I want to make sure, one, <laughs> one because I love her. Okay, I love her with all my heart. I love my wife. And I will never leave her. But two, two, I made a vow. And I'm not going to go back on that. And the Bible is very clear about our vows. And three, this picture of Christ in the church you know, for my children's sake. There's so many reasons. You know, I'm not even going to go listing all. I, I keep on thinking, like, well, there's a lot of reasons why I'm not going to force my wife. <laughs> there's so many. But what I'm trying to, to get across here is this, is this, this imagery, this, this symbolism of, of Christ in the church. And it's so important. It's so important. People need to have this understanding. And it's, there's so many levels of the truth for people to understand the gospel. This is just one little element that can be a part of our daily lives, day in, day out, that people aren't even going to be thinking about the gospel when they see this. That's not even going to come across their mind. But it's a basic truth and a concept that will permeate so that hopefully it will be easier for someone to grasp the concept of salvation. The, the, one of the biggest problems when we go out soul winning is that people just have a hard time getting the concept uh, down of Christ completely paying for their salvation in full. And that has nothing to do with our works. That is a concept that is very hard for some people to grasp. Some people grasp it and reject it. But a lot of people don't get saved because they simply don't quite get it. In their mind, they're, they're trying to reconcile it. And we have so many attacks on, this, on the notion of salvation from you know, Santa Claus saying that you have to be good in order to receive a gift, screwing up the, the concept of a free gift that it's not based on any works, it's just something that you receive for free. Or from marriage that's supposed to be until death to your part. Look, if your spouse does something wrong to you, forgive them. Stay in that relationship with them. And, and try to make it work and try to fit your role. You say, well, my wife's not being submissive to me. Well, why don't you just worry about your role? Why don't you worry about loving her and doing things for her? And you know what? Maybe her attitude will change about that. You say, well, my husband doesn't love me the way he's supposed to. Well, why don't you just get in your role and be the obedi obedient, submissive wife that the Bible says that you ought to be? Maybe his heart will change when he sees you doing good and, and, just, and you sticking to God's way. <clears throat> Let's close with this, the last verse in, uh, in Genesis 2, or Genesis 2.25. The Bible says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Nudity in the, in the Bible in general, especially in front of the opposite gender, is always linked with shame. It's always a shame to, to show your nakedness in front of other people and, and to have that exposed. But the one time where... It's acceptable between the opposite genders, only between a man and his wife. And um, the Bible says here, the, the, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And that's where we get that quote from Jesus saying, you know, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, is from Hebrews 13, 5. And, um, <clears throat> man, who would have thought that you're reading in Genesis and we're going to go to he Ephesians 5, right? But, <laughs> but God gives us, no, it, it, you know, we see the creation of man and we see the creation of woman and, and we start to get an understanding of our, of our own purpose what are we here for from from the creation why did God even create us to begin with the Bible says for his pleasure we are and were created but we also get to see the purpose you know Adam he was created and he was told to, to do this work he was, he was, he was supposed to, told to keep the vineyard right from the very beginning that we see the man going out and doing work and we see the woman being a meat and a help for the for the for the man and in chapter 3 we're going to see where your names are Eve being the mother of all li living. Her name 
is giving her an idea of being, of being a mom, of being a mother, of raising children. It's a very important job. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, your great words, dear Lord. I pray to uh, please just uh, help us all to, to love your words and to understand them and to not be ashamed of them, especially in a, in a, in a wicked, corrupt world that we live in, in a, a world of darkness, dear Lord, where, where people think that we're ignorant and stupid and um, call us all kinds of names for holding these types of values and for just sticking to what your word says, dear God. But um, help us just to be strong in this type of a world and, and to not be ashamed, not, not to back off or to compromise on what our standards are, but that we would learn them and live them from your word. Lord, we love you. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.